Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I'm Carolyn Ward, CEO of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, and welcome to the first webinar of 2023, where we're going to look at the botanical wonderland that is the Blue Ridge Parkway. We're joined today by Dr. Chris Ulrey. Chris has been with the Park Service on the Blue Ridge Parkway for 24 years, started his career in the Forest Service. So we're really happy to have Chris join us. He's the plant ecologist for the Parkway and what a better person to talk to us about the botanical findings along the Parkway. The Blue Ridge Parkway is pretty special and pretty unique. It is one of the most biodiverse parks in the national park system and one of the most biodiverse places in the temperate world. So Chris is going to talk to us a lot about the landscape, the scenery, and talk about why we have such botanical diversity that falls along the Blue Ridge Parkway. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chris Ulrey. Chris, welcome. Hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to uh, uh, join in on this presentation. Um, for me, putting this uh, presentation together is the least I can do uh, for the foundation who helps the parkway so so much. I'm also happy to talk about plants with an audience that has an appreciation for plants, or if you don't, I hope maybe that this presentation will perk your interest in them a bit. You know, as long as I can remember, I've had an interest in plants, whether it's pulling weeds with my grandfather or monitoring rare plants at work. I'm grateful for the career that I've had in botany and plant ecology on the Blue Ridge Parkway for the last 24 years. And uh, now I'm the one with the gray hair, but I'm still amazed uh, by plants. And uh, there's, a, there's a saying that goes that an extroverted botanist talks to you while looking at your feet and an introverted botanist talks to you while looking at their feet. Uh, and another one that I like says that an intro says, uh, has a saying, it says uh, introverted, but willing to discuss plants. So I can certainly identify with those sentiments and uh, I am uh, very pleased to have this presentation today and talk to you guys about plants. So, um, you know, we're in the, gray days of winter, but very soon uh, spring will be here and the forest floor will start to green up and then the forest canopy will follow behind. It's an annual event that I always look forward to and each year it just seems to get more and more special for me. So we have these plants, uh, the first plants that come up on the forest floor are known as spring ephemerals. They take advantage of the sunlight um, that's present before the canopy fully leaves out. Um, and it's not uncommon to find these large swaths of large flower trillium, trillium grandiflorum, or some other really, um, some of my favorite spring ephemerals are the uh, larkspur or delphinium tricorni, or the eastern shooting star, primula media, which looks like Someone once described it to me. It looks like uh, they've they taken a hair dryer to the flower and blown all the petals backwards. Uh, one of my favorites is spotted mandarin or Prosardes maculata, which is a flower that's only about three quarters of an inch or so across. And to be a, to really appreciate it, you've got to get up close and observe these uh, these petals with all the spots on them. It's really spectacular. But then as uh, spring kind of uh, shifts into summer and we get a whole new suite of plants. Um, so just a few examples. Uh, this is a Blue Ridge St. John's wort, the Hypericum michelianum, which uh, occurs in sort of large clonal patches. And if you get there just when the flowers open and it's a warm, sunny day, you'll uh, detect the, the odor of butterscotch that comes from these flowers. Um, also in the summer, we see the uh, sometimes see the, the rare uh, and endangered large purple fringed orchid or Platanthera grandiflora. Like I said, it's rare and typically occurs at the higher elevations on the parkway. 
World loose thrive or Lysomachia quadrifolia is a very common plant and it's often overlooked. The flowers are fairly small, maybe a quarter inch or so across. But again, if you uh, take the time to get down, crouch down and look at these flowers up close, you'll just be, um, uh, I often marvel at the details of the flowers. And then as summer goes along, we get um, some plants, uh, another suite of plants. Um, this is the Northern Obedia plant, Physostegia virginiana, subspecies virginiana. So-called obedient plant because if you burn, uh, bend one of the flowers, it actually holds that position. And then as we get into late summer, um, we get these, uh, this is the, the time of the megaforbs or the golden rods and the asters and all these um, large herbaceous plants that you find in these, in these meadows, um, just full of pollinating insects, butterflies, you know, it's, it's a, it's sort of the last hurrah of the flower, the parade of plants that flower throughout uh, the growing season. And I'd be remiss if I said, you know, it's not, plants are not all about flowers. The, the fruits can often be very interesting. This is the tall milkweed or Asclepias exaltata. Um, and these fruits, when they ripen, will split and um, open up to reveal this mesh, uh, these fine filaments of silk that is attached to each seed that are then windborne. Um, and that's a, an interesting adaptation to how this species has evolved to, um, to, to disperse its seed. And, that's a whole nother topic, uh, another area of interest on how plants have evolved these different strategies for seed dispersal. So I could go on and on about the plants of the parkway, but uh, you might be wondering why, why is the parkway so diverse? We have uh, a current uh, counting uh, uh, 1,671 uh, species of vascular plants in the park. That makes us third in the whole um, uh, park service and only behind uh, a couple of parks like the Grand Canyon, I think, and maybe uh, I go with the other one is, but we're, we're third in, in, a, in, a, in a park service of over 400 units. Um, and we have a whole lot of uh, uh, rare uh, and endangered species on the parkway as well. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time to maybe try to explain to everyone why, why we're so diverse and, and so unique. And it really comes down to these factors. We got the geologic history, uh, climate, the, the north-south geographic range, the geology and the soils, and then the various microhabitats. So geologic history. Um, so here is a, a picture of uh, what the world looked like 200 million years ago. I know it's a long time, but um, it, it's, it's kind of, I think, uh, useful to think about what the landscape was like um, in these long time scales. So, so this is basically the supercontinent known as Pangaea, kind of my laser pointer here, where um, you can see the out overlay of the United States onto this supercontinent. Um, and this supercontinent split up into the continents that we know today through a phenomenon known as continental drift, which is due to plate tectonics which is basically the outer crust of the earth is made up of these large plates that have been kind of slowly moving around for the last 3.4 billion years uh, since the earth has been around. And it's these, uh, the, this plate tectonics and these moving in these plates that causes earthquakes and also causes mountain building events, et cetera. But um, if we go, if you look at this uh, 200 million years ago, I'm kind of hovering over uh, the Southern Appalachian region, the mountains that we have today. And now I'm going to advance through time and bring it to present day. And there's going to be a lot of things happening on these slides. But what I want you to focus on is the, con the constant location of these mountains over time. So here we are 200 million years ago. Here's the, the mountains again still. It's 170 million. 150 million is the, the, the time frame in the bottom. You can see. Now Africa and South America are starting to pull away. 120 million mountains are still there. 
80 million, 50 million, the Rockies are now going strong, 20 million years. And here's the last uh, ice age. Um, and um, this is when the Great Lakes were formed uh, because the uh, these glaciers, which only made it as far south as you see here, basically scoured the landscape. And then as, as they receded and all that water melted, um, the depressions that were left by the glaciers filled up with water and created the Great Lakes. So also noteworthy is that note how the mountains are here and the glaciers did not reach as far. And this has got some pretty um, big in, uh, implications in terms of why this area is so diverse, which I'll talk about in the next slide or so. Yeah, so here we are, here we are today. Um, so um, during that uh, last uh, ice age, all of those species had to either um, move south in front of the glaciers or they were, or they got, they died under the glaciers. And so think of it as a compression of the flora and the fauna of North America, at least on the East Coast. Now all that, all those species got pushed southward and uh, many of them um, stayed as the ice retreated and the climate warmed back up. Many of them stayed on these high peaks in this area because the climate was very similar to what the species were used to um, further north. Um, and later on, I'm going to talk about some of the um, specific species um, that we work with on the parkway um, that are a result of this phenomenon. Okay, another factor is uh, climate. The, uh, the parkway um, has a range of precipitation that goes from a low of 40 inches to over 100 inches per year. Um, we have a wide range of elevation from 600 feet in elevation up the James River to over 6,400 feet um, at, down at Richland Balsam. And so as you go up in elevation every 1,000 feet, you, the temperature drops by five degrees. So elevation is, is a good measure of temperature as well. Um, the parkway is long, as many of you know, it's 469 miles long. Um, we think we have at least 1,200 miles of boundary, um, 91,000 plus or take uh, acres in the park. And we're the third uh, largest park also in terms of geographic spread, breadth. And, and in other words, if you go north, south, east, and west, east and west, we're the third largest park, only behind two up in Alaska. Um, and so basically this parkway is because of the layout, it's it's like a giant transect. Um, and transects are what biologists will often use to um, sample an area to see how diverse it is. So, so if you have a track of land, you wanna know what the diversity is like on that land, a simple way to do that is to walk a line and just count every species that you see on that line. And so the parkway is kind of like a, like a transect, a mega transect, but it goes also tends to, go through this super diverse area known as the Southern Appalachians. Um, because the mountains are so old, the, the, this ancient geology is very complex. Um, and so over time, uh, long periods of time, those rocks weather through wind and erosion, et cetera, to form soils. And so we have not only a complex history of geology, but the resulting um, soils that come from that are also very complex. So that's another factor that adds to the diversity in this region. Um, and then finally, um, you look at like the combination of moisture and temperature and soils, those combinations can come together in different ways to result in these uh, often small, but very unique habitats. And often it's in these places where we see um, our rare species. So some examples of some of the rare plants on the parkway or that are found in these uh, unique habitats on the left is GM radiatum or spreading avens, um, which uh, prefers to uh, or occurs on these rock outcrops where the summers are very cool and it's wet year round. And then the species on the right, Lytris helleri or Heller's blazing star is also a rock outcrop specialist, but in those rock outcrops, it's very dry and prone to fire. So this species has uh, adapted um, characteristics that, that uh, 
uh, make it um, fire adapted. Um, we have over 80 bogs and wetlands at least on the parkway. Um, and one of the rare plants that is a wetland spe specialist is uh, swamp pink or Helonius bellata. It's estimated that over 90% of the wetlands in the Southern Appalachians have been destroyed due to agricultural use or housing development where these um, wet areas were ditched and the water was drained away to make them suitable. So the parkway has some of the best and last remaining examples of wetlands in the region. And uh, we, ha we have a, a couple of populations of this species in the park. And unfortunately, deer just love to eat um, the flowers of this plant. This is in the lily, lily family and deer love lilies and orchids. And so the way we um, protect this species and keep it from becoming extinct at, at the local level, we often have to erect cages around, um, around the individual flower plants. So that's what this, this is picture of here. Um, another plant that's rare on the parkway and it grows in these um, wet meadows and forested seeps is a plant called gray's lily or lilium gray eye. It's a little picture of it right here. It's really difficult to, to detect unless it's flowering and then it kind of jumps out. But when it's not flowering, it blends in with everything else. Um, flowers are really spectacular. Uh, unfortunately, this um, species is declining due to a fungal pathogen that we're still trying to figure out how to uh, combat. Uh, another rare plant, uh, see I told you I could go on about plants. Another rare plant is uh, the small world pagonia or Isotres medelioides. Um, this is an, uh, a really rare orchid. Um, it's got a unique life history. The, uh, the flowers are self-fertilizing, which means no pollinators are needed. And it produces lots and lots of seed, but nobody has ever been able to grow it from seed. And nobody has ever seen a seedling in the wild. Um, and it's also had this uh, unique relationship with mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal fungi, which are fungi in the soil that interface with plants at the root level and assist the plants in extracting water and nutrients from soil in a better way than they, than they would if they didn't have these associations. So um, this plant um, will often, we've been tracking it for a number of years and the plant will show up and flower like you see here. And then it'll, we'll come back next year and there's no plant there and uh, next year and it's still not there. And sometimes it can be up to five years and suddenly the plant will pop back up. So it's able to, to get its nutrition somehow from these mycorrhizal fungi. It's really interesting and a difficult plant to, to monitor and to manage. So I wanted to go in a little bit more detail about some of the work we've done with uh, one of these rare plants. And I'll talk about the spreading avens or the GM radiatum that I mentioned earlier. That's a, the rock outcrop specialist that likes these full uh, moist and wet places. It's in, the, it's in the rose family. Um, it's very sensitive to uh, climate change um, because of all the locations, and there's 12 worldwide, and they're all in the Southern Appalachians, we have um, installed detailed uh, weather monitoring equipment that captures the temperature like every 20 minutes year round. And these sites are, these populations are separated by hundreds of miles sometimes. And when we look at the data, that weather, that weather data, we find that all of those sites are have an average temperature that's within three degrees of each other. So this, this plant is really dialed in to um, its habitat uh, requirements. Um, and so it grows, like I was saying, it grows out on these rock out crops. And for the last 20 years or so, I've been monitoring um, this species on the parkway, as well as other sites off the parkway, such as Forest Service and state parks and other private lands to try to understand um, what the long-term outlook is like looking for this, for this um, species. Um, and without, we, we published a paper uh, a couple of years back, I guess, and just some highlights. Um, we, we predicted that by 2050, half of the current habitat um, for GM would become unsuitable due to climate change. And we hypothesized that as the winters get warmer, there's going to be more freeze-thaw cycles. 
um, and that that freeze thaw is going to dislodge rocks and ice and and impact these plants that are making a living out on these tiny cracks and ledges on these cliffs. Um, so this is uh, one of the sites uh, in the summer, and this is what it looks like in the winter. And so again, if the winters get warmer, um, this ice is going to form and then it's going to melt in the day and then it's going to reform when it gets cold again and it's going to melt again. And so those cycles, every time you go through those cycles, that's how rocks get split and how rocks get dislodged and then big chunks of ice fall off and that's going to cause damage to the, to the plants. Um, so we are looking at ways to protect this species by doing seed banks where we collect seed and put it in long-term storage. Uh, we're looking at possibly establishing new populations further north um, where the um, to try to uh, help with the uh, effects of climate change. Um, I've got a few more topics I want to talk about. If there's time, Caroline, how are we doing on time? Good. Um, we are doing just fine. All right. Well, let me let me run through a few more topics about some other things that I'm involved with on the plant side of, of things on the parkway. Um, visitor impacts are really big. Uh, and the parkway is the most visited unit in the National Park Service. And while that's a great thing, it's also can be a challenging thing to manage if people are uh, doing the wrong thing, wrong thing when they're visiting the parks. And so we have um, started using this volunteer rover program in these high use areas, like at Craggy Pinnacle, Devil's Courthouse, and Rough Ridge. Um, and we've gotten great support from the foundation to. Um, to um, have these basically these volunteers that are staged, they do uh, four hour shifts at these sites and they talk to visitors and educate them about the significance of the site and the rare resources that are there and how it's important that, that folks stay on the trail and not jump off the trail. Because we found that no matter what kind of signs we put up, um, nothing is as good as having a live person there interacting with visitors. Um, I'm going to talk about poaching, invasive plants, climate change, and invasive insects next. So here's a picture of uh, ginseng, Panax hinkifolius, um, really high valuable plant, medicinal plant. Another one is, um, this is a bloodroot, and both of these are have medicinal qualities that are attractive to folks who would choose to illegally remove them from the park and for, for profit. And so we constantly are watching out for this and going after these folks. Um, another plant that's often poached is Galax. Um, this one's used in floral arrangements um, overseas. And um, we're actually getting a little bit less concerned about Galax because unlike the previous two species where the roots are the the harvested product with Galax, the, the product is just the largest leaves. And so um, it looks like we're not totally convinced just yet, but it's looking like that might be a sustainable practice. But uh, I don't want to say that too, too loudly at this point until we know for sure. Um, on invasive plants, um, you know, to protect our native flora, we, we really need to control these non-native invasive plants. And we define invasive plants as a as a plant that um, aggressively invades an area and outcompetes the native species. And this happens because um, species evolve in their different parts of the world, and they have uh, relationships are formed that prevent those species from monopolizing and taking up all the resources. And so, when you take that species and move it to a new location you've disrupted or broken those relationships and often the result is, is rampant growth. And so we have this list of least wanted plants that are all non-native invasive plants that I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, that we're, we're uh, currently uh, managing on the parkway. Uh, and then I wanted to um, talk about one in particular, this is the wavy leaf basket grass, which is a pretty new um, invasive plant on the scene and it hasn't quite reached the levels of abundance as all those on the previous slide. 
And so we're asking for help from anybody who sees this to let us know, because it's a whole lot easier to treat these infestations before they get too, too abundant. I'll have a slide, I think, later on on how you can help with that. Um, I also work with um, um, forest pests and diseases. Uh, one that many are familiar with is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is just devastating all the hemlocks in the region. Estimate, estimates range from 90 to 95% mortality of all the hemlocks. Um, on the parkway, we use chemical treatments to save individual trees, as many as we could. Um, and we've also been releasing biological control. These are um, beetles that are specific to, um, they only feed on this hemlock woolly adelgid. So I could talk about this, this is a whole nother presentation, but suffice it to say that the, the trees that we've treated, we are hopeful will become the seed source for the next generation of hemlock trees. Um, so hopefully we can get back in the, you know, in the future to hemlock stands that we once had. Um, and so there's also uh, the spongy moth, formerly known as the gypsy moth. Um, and it was brought to this country into the Massachusetts area uh, as, a, as an industry for producing silk. Um, and it's been spreading, um, emanating south and west from and a little bit north uh, from, from Massachusetts ever since. Um, this slide shows areas, this is from 1998, where it, it's already kind of um, been making impacts. And then the green is all the, uh, the host um, that are susceptible to, to spongy moth. And the host is oak, oak, all species of oaks. And so now if I go to today, um, we're working, this is the blue is the range of where, where the spongy moth occurs. And then this light green is a zone that we call slow the spread zone. And this is a, an interagency effort led by the Forest Service where we um, identify and treat these small outbreak populations as a, as a strategy to slow down the, the, the spread of this, of this species. But we are starting to get treatments um, around the Grandfather Mountain area and up near the state line on the parkway this year. Okay, I'm getting close, getting close, Carolyn. Um, phenology uh, is a tool that we're using to help um, evaluate climate change. This is a great uh, citizen science um, uh, effort and one that we use uh, volunteers a uh, fair bit on. We use uh, this uh, app called Nature's Notebook, and there's a link for it here at the bottom. I think we're going to provide links um, in this recording afterwards. But um, it's basically phenology is nature's calendar of when things happen. And so climate change is going to disrupt the, the, the timing of events, which is going to lead to mismatches. So think about when the leaves come out in the spring, how that syncs with insect emergent and how that emergence and how that matches up with the migratory, the arrival of migratory songbirds. Um, and so we uh, were able to We've started this for the last couple of years. Um, this is just a graph of uh, blueberries when they flower and versus when they're ripe. And so by doing this repeatedly over, over a number of years, we'll be able to see changes in, in when these events are happening. Okay, uh, next to the last slide, uh, some resources for folks. Um, cannot recommend enough iNaturalist. Um, it's, a, it's a website and it's an app. Um, and it's just a great way you see, a, 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 you can take a picture with your phone of anything, plant, animal, whatever it is, post it on iNaturalist and you can help get it, help it, help you get it identified. Um, for us on the parkway, any observation that people make through iNaturalist that falls within the boundary of the, of the Blue Ridge Parkway, I'll get notified of it. So that's a way that I can like see new species, new invasive plants. Um, maybe somebody, I mean, we, I think a couple of years ago, we had two new rare plants uh, occur on the parkway that we didn't even know about um, through somebody's observation. There's some, um, some great, you know, picture books out there. This is just a sampling of some that are out there. Um, this thing on the right, top right here, this is called a hand lens. And if you really want to get and appreciate 
the finer details of plants, I highly encourage you to get a 10X hand lens. Um, enough said about that. So if you want to get involved, here's some, some suggestions. Uh, consider volunteering on the parkway. Um, I'm going to, in the next slide, I'm going to give you some contact information for me and for, the, for volunteers. Um, you can also contact the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation and see how you can help the parkway there. Um, also, like I was saying, use iNaturalist and Nature's Notebook to make observations on your own. Okay, I'm sorry, I know I went over. Here's my um, email address. And if you're interested in volunteering, there's a generic volunteer email address. Um, you can just say, here's what I'm interested in doing, and we will do our best to find a, a way that you can help us. So if there's any time for questions, I'll be happy to see what I can do, Carolyn. Chris, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I have seen some of this before, but I learn something every time I um, see a presentation from you. That curvy plant had no idea about that. So Chris has given us some wonderful ways to get involved, get engaged, help our park, help our community. Uh, I know there's certain things I might have planted in my yard that I shouldn't probably have planted in my yard now. And so um, we do have some questions. I'm going to ask one because I saw it repeated uh, multiple times. Are there any non-toxic ways to get rid of kudzu? <laughs> yes, there are actually. Um, there's two that come to mind immediately. One is um, goats. <laughs> goats are, uh, there's actually folks that... Uh, will do this as part of their business. Um, they, they'll bring a herd of goats and just let them chomp away. Um, and the other is you can, if you're persistent enough, you can just mow it and cut it. And if you do that repeatedly, you know, you're gonna cut it the first time, it's gonna re-sprout. You cut it again, it's gonna re-sprout a little bit less. And every time you cut it, you're basically exhausting the energy reserves in that plant. And so if you are, uh, if, if you have a stronger willpower than the kudzu, you can win. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, thank you so much. And we will uh, include the rest of the questions when we send out the email with the recording. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Chris, thank you for taking thank us on a trip down the parkway to look at the diversity of the flora found in our park. Thanks, everyone. Y'all have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.